listen to and for the Word of God as it comes to us from Exodus chapter 3 beginning with verse 1. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. But he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now bow together. <coughs> now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. The Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, not every one of all generations may recognize the name of Albert Schweitzer to the great generation and perhaps to those in, in the baby boomers, at least a few of them. His name is well known as a missionary and as a physician. Albert Schweitzer grew up in a town in France called Kaysburg, to a family of highly educated people who had been leaders in the area that was known then as Alsace-Lorraine, uh, that border of a part between Germany and France that was established after the Prussian War. Schweitzer's family had a very long history of serving as pastors in that region, as well as being quite well known for being musicians, especially organists. Schweitzer began his academic studies as was customary for his family right at the turn of the century. At the University of Strasbourg where he wrote his doctoral thesis on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Not an easy subject to master. From 1899 to 1912 he served as the pastor of St. Nicholas Church. He raised money for the struggling church by offering concerts, organ concerts in the area, and was considered to be a very gifted 
concert organist even until he reached his age of mid, into his mid-80s. At the age of 35, at the beginning of the 20th century, he wrote a book that was to change many thinkings about theology. The book was called <coughs> Quest for the Most Historical Jesus, and it was part of my required reading in seminary and as well as in college. But that same year, his understanding of his call took a change, and he decided he would go to Africa, not as a pastoral missionary, so to speak, but as a medical missionary, and he entered medical school. He was a man whose, whose life would have fit very nicely into the academic arena. He could have been a professor at almost any seminary of the time, teaching young minds, new thoughts of God and new ways to serve the Lord. Who knows how many lives that experience might have given him to proclaim the goodness of Christ. But he decided instead, no, I will not do that. I am not going to be that kind of a pastor. Instead, he picked up his family and traveled to what was the French Equatorial Africa where he founded a hospital in the country that is now, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Gavin. There, in a town by the name of Lambernet, he established that hospital, which by 1960 was providing health care to over 500 patients a day. Now, I, I tell that story really for only one reason. Because for him, in order for him to come to the fullest understanding of both the revelation of God and what God wanted him to do with his life, he had to travel outside of his known comfort level and go somewhere that was beyond what was natural for him, perhaps, or perhaps even safe. And that's what Moses had just done. When we read the story of Moses' call of the great patriarch of the Israelites, that is titled in so many Bibles, the call of Moses, our focus is so often drawn on what happened to Moses, rather than where he was when it happened. Sure, the bush was there burning and not being consumed. It is a profound image that both scientists and scholars have been trying to explain for years. And yes, the conversation that Moses had with the voice of God is certainly deeply profound on one level and on another level perhaps rather comical. Moses' reluctance to be the messenger of God is something that we all can easily identify with because we have all had those occasions where we feel that God has called us to do or be something or to engage in some kind of service and we have found some reason that was accurate to us that we could not do it. And then the giving of the name of the divine was so crucial that even in modern times there are many parts of the Hebrew faith who find it so sacred that they will not even pronounce it. But it all takes place beyond the wilderness. The wilderness was the place that Moses would have to go through a number of times. He just went through there as he led the sheep. He would do it again as he has to lead the Israelites out of bondage and they travel their journeys to test out this new relationship with God who had just brought them out of slavery. It was at the edge of the wilderness, we are told, that Jesus was baptized as if there was kind of a, a shroud that separated the comfortable life that Jesus had known before baptism from the life that he would know after. And it was into the wilderness again that Jesus would have to travel when he was confronted with the temptations to form his identity as the Son of God. The wilderness was the fertile ground out of which so many psalms grew and where the Hebrews as a worshiping community 
came to feel so deeply the need for God. And it was in the wilderness that so many of the prophets had their profound experience of being called by God. And believe it or not, it's the place where you and I often have the most profound experiences with God as well. As summer comes to an end in so many ways, as this sermon was being prepared, I began to think of this summer as the summer of many wildernesses. It started off, at least for me, with our denomination talking about things that were uncomfortable to talk about at the General Assembly, as we as delegates were asked not only to debate the mundane issues of organizations and the faith, but also to talk about the difficult ones, as what is the definition of marriage, and is it possible in faith to consider same-gender marriages? Is it appropriate for churches to become involved in politics or financial matters of different companies? And as we talked and spoke, we knew that it was not comfortable for everyone, and that somewhere unseen in that great auditorium in Detroit, there was this bush burning that was not being consumed. Well, somehow we made it through those arguments and those debates. We made it through hearing somewhere in the back of our minds the words that God spoke to Moses, I will be with you. And life, and in some cases faith, changed because God came into our midst. And then a few weeks later, Officer Rod Broadway was ambushed when responding to the cry of a woman for help. And the people who live and work in Indianapolis began to think that maybe there are certain areas that are such a chaotic wilderness that we cannot go there. And the community rallied once again and tried so hard to find a way to bring God's grace out of it. In the aftermath of that shooting, the staff at Irvington Presbyterian Church struggled in a way to, to find something that could be done to address the tragedy of what is taking place in our cities. <clears throat> and the rally next week is the end outcome of that, but it was a process of many conversations to get there. We knew that there was something that needed to be done in faith, but just what should it be, especially for this particular congregation who is the blessed of, has the blessing in many ways of being isolated from much of the violence that takes place in our city. But we did have peacemaking money that we could offer to organizations that were supporting change. In, in our society and trying to move people to nonviolence. A number of organizations were suggested as we began to think about the possibility of sharing our financial resources with them as they try to curb violence and increase education and job training. One of those organizations is called the Ten Point Coalition. You may have read a brief article about it in the newspaper last week. The Ten Point Coalition is a group of African-American clergy who walk the streets of Indianapolis to confront the people who are at most, most risk. The important words there are to confront the people who are at most risk because they do not confront the potential victims of crime. They confront the potential perpetrators of crime. When their website addresses their goals and their missions, it says this. We are to be a catalyst for creating a strategic vision, program, programmatic structure and financial resources necessary for saving at-risk children from crises such as violence, drugs, teenage pregnancy, and chronic unemployment. 
a noble and courageous goal. Their target, they say, is youth who are 14 to 24 years of age in hot spots of high risk in our city. Again, a high and noble goal. And they go on to say, our method is to encourage high risk youth, excuse me, our method is to engage high risk youth, drug dealers, and gangbangers in order to encourage them to live, to leave a life of crime and violence and make healthier choices. A fabulous goal. And as we talked about it in the planning process, one of our members was courageous enough to say, that activity is so foreign to me, I would have absolutely no idea what to do. And we knew that to conquer that which is so complicated in our society, we would have to walk in to the wilderness. And as the summer comes to an end, we're living in the aftermath of the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, where once again, violence has stuck its ugly head up into our consciousness. Back and forth, groups and organizations have gone with accusations or activities until finally, finally, people in general came to the conclusion that it is not the job of one particular party or group or another to make our streets and our cities safe, but it is the responsibility of everyone. As people of faith, we sometimes have to stretch ourselves into those wilderness areas a little bit and wander about, even if it's a little bit risky, in order to hear what God is saying in those bushes that are not being consumed. Now, I certainly believe that there is a huge difference between giving one's life away and throwing one's life away. But I also believe that God in God's love and mercy asks us or challenges us to be aware of the need to walk where sometimes, sometimes, it may be a little bit uncomfortable if we are really going to hear what God has to say. Different people over the years have told in different ways of their experiences they had when they go on our Mexico mission trip. And every time that it's told, I am, I am struck to a certain extent by the difference in tone between those who are telling the story after they've gone for the first time and those who are telling the story after they have gone a number of times. Because in many ways, one only walks into that particular wilderness just once. Back in 1999, when our band of 13 experienced that particular journey, we tried to prepare ourselves as best we could for it. Lois Williams, who was a member of this congregation, taught what she called Spanish language classes for construction workers. Some of you will remember the class that was held up in room 24 to help prepare us so that we would have a smooth transition into the culture that we were traveling. Those classes were held before church, and at that time, I believe we had, might have had two services, and it was a little difficult for me to get to those classes. So after a number of years of classes, I came away knowing two very important words. Hello? And bathroom.
who knows why, because I was the biggest one of the group. This unknown elderly Hispanic lady pointed her finger at me and went like this. I knew I was in for a treat. I followed that moving finger to the back of the house where she pointed to me, uh, pointed out for me a, a, a bag of cement. And then she pointed that way, which to me obviously meant that bag is supposed to go over there. And you are supposed to carry it. <coughs> well, in Mexico, those bags are weighed out a little bit differently than they are here, and that bag turned out to weigh 110 pounds. And off it went to my shoulder, which may explain the trips I take to the chiropractor. <laughs> we took a break from our construction at noon and returned to this large open area, the courtyard outside of their church, in the middle of scorching heat. We sat on folding chairs as our host family passed out lunch for us. It was tortillas. But none of us, none of us, had ever seen a tortilla cooked in a corn husk. So we held these things in our hands and said, well, these must be hand warmers, and why do we need these? Where are the hamburgers and the fries? Whereas all those calories that we were expecting to have to nourish us. Anyone who has been on one of those trips can give one detail after another of how that experience in the wilderness changed the life of not only those who were traveling into it, but changed the lives of those who lived there. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, God is going to call us out of our comfort zone to where it may be difficult to adjust to all of those things that are going on around us. It doesn't have to be in a foreign country. It can be the lack of comfort I felt the first time I tried to tutor a third grader in math who told me I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Seems they teach math differently now than they did in the Stone Ages. But God continues to ask us to wander into the wilderness where this burning bush is there that we don't understand. And all we might know, all we might remember, the words that Moses said. Go ahead. I will be with you. Those confidence building words, those supportive words, come to us out of the purpose if we dare to travel through it and beyond. So thanks be to God for bushes that burn but are consumed, that in the seeing and the listening, you will be fine. Presence of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.